I am Claire Gilman. I'm the chief curator at the Drawing Center and organizer of the exhibition, A Greater Beauty, The Drawings of Khalil Gibran, on view through early September in our main and lower level galleries. And I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight for the second of three programs dedicated to the exhibition and to exploring the work of poet, artist, and legendary cultural figure, Khalil Gibran. Tonight, we are pleased to have with us Lisa Amadi, who is the Director of Programs for the Foundation for Spirituality and the Arts, who is also our co-sponsor this evening. For over, and I'm just gonna give you sort of a, br a brief intro to these two amazing individuals, and um, you can read more about them in the uh, sheet that is on your seats. And uh, for over 20 years, Amadi has been organizing exhibitions, programs, and experimental forums that educate the public about significant and often misconstrued historical, cultural, and, and this is her word, spiritually vibrant subjects, which I love, subject matters, evident in the works of artists um, from Asia, the Middle East, and around the world. Joining Lisa tonight is Paul Gordon Chandler, Bishop of the Episcopal Church in Wyoming. Chandler grew up in Senegal, West Africa, and has worked as an author, art curator, peacemaker, and social entrepreneur, engaging in particular with the fields of spirituality, interreligious peace building, and the Middle East. Um, and he is also the author of the newly re-released biography of Gibran, In Search of a Prophet, A Spiritual Journey with Khalil Gibran, which is available um, for sale in our bookstore um, tonight, uh, along with other books by Gibran and other books on Gibran, including our um, exhibition catalog. It is such an honor to have you both here. Together, uh, Lisa and Paul Gordon will discuss Khalil Gibran in the context of art's longstanding engagement with the realms of religious faith and spiritual, spiritual expression. So Gibran uh, was many things, a uh, famed author responsible for The Prophet, which was published um, exactly 100 years ago, and one of the best-selling books of all time. Uh, he was a passionate and dedicated artist, producing drawings and paintings alongside his writ written work, which he intended both for inclusion in his books and as standalone images. And he was a foundational member of the Arab-American diaspora at the turn of the 20th century who is instrumental in bringing attention to the plight of the Syrian people in the Eastern Mediterranean and in his adopted home country, the US. And I think in order to understand Gibran, it is important to recognize to the degree to which he existed in a state of in-betweenness between all of these different realities, um, a state which reflects his own journey as someone who was between, um, in particular, art forms, between writing and, um, and visual arts uh, between nations. Gibran never became a US citizen, although he probably could have. Uh, between languages, um, Arabic was Gibran's first language, but he didn't actually know when he came to the US how to write in Arabic. And so he returned to Beirut to study when he was a teenager, and he published first in the US in Arabic and then shifted to writing in English in 1918. So he really didn't have a, a kind of um, home language in a certain sense. And um, between faiths. So Gibran was Christian, but he was essentially non-sectarian, and he incorporated numerous uh, faiths, both Eastern and Western, into his art and his writing. And I think his all-encompassing spirituality guided his worldview in that it fueled his perpetual quest for something other, um, perhaps better but unreachable um, in the here and now. And it is this aspect of Gibran or Gibran's spirituality um, that Lisa and Paul Gordon will discuss tonight, um, not only in relationship to the writer and artist, but also as it pertains to their own work and views on art in the contemporary moment. Um, at least that's my understanding, but they're gonna let things flow as well. See, see where the night takes them. So they will each give a short presentation after which they will engage in conversation and we will open things up to the audience. So thank you all for coming. Let's see here. Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? It's wonderful to be here, and I want to thank you for coming out on a, what are we today? Tuesday night. Someone asked me when I flew in, and I couldn't even remember, you know. But it's uh, very special 
to be with you and a real privilege uh, to share a little bit about someone who I think not only was one of the most profound figures that lived in the last century, but who I think is increasingly exceedingly relevant for our times. Someone who was an immigrant, as was just mentioned a minute ago, who ended up a prophetic voice during his own lifetime, and whose words are even more timely today. The 20th century, early 20th century, Lebanese American poet, artist, and mystic, Khalil Gibran. I'm curious, in a group like this, and I don't know how many we are this evening, how many of you, in one way or another, have encountered his best-selling book, The Prophet, just raise your hand, for example. Okay. You know, it's fascinating for me when I go around. Often it's 80 to 90% of the audience. Often I'll have people, when, if I'm at a book signing or something like that, come up to me afterwards and bring their treasured copy that they actually, their grandmother or great-grandmother gave them. And, uh, and, they, and they may not read it much, but it's got a sacred place on the bookshelf in that regard. Sometimes something written long ago becomes even seemingly more relevant than during its own time. And now more than ever, I think there's a need to hear voices that call us to unity and to call us to respect and to be inspired to live deeply and generously in our thinking and actions toward the other, whomever the other is. And I believe Khalil Gibran can be just that voice and his profound insights offer our day much needed guidance and wisdom. When I was living in the Middle East, and I spent the majority of my life living in the Middle East, and I, and I began looking deeply at his life, I was struck by how enthusiastically Khalil is loved both throughout the Middle East and, of course, in much of the West. The East was proud of him, and the West admired him. He's very much a uniting figure. And I came to discover, to discover that Khalil Gibran is really, I would say, the, the supreme East-West figure and as a result can be an unparalleled guide, and I would even say an unparalleled spiritual guide related to peace, related to harmony, certainly related to the building of bridges between those of different backgrounds. And his life, work, and approach touch on so many of the critical issues of today, the need to build bridges between cultures and creeds, we know that's a need here, care for the environment, equality for women, interest in spirituality as opposed to institutional religion, status of refugees, conflict in the Middle East, the inclusive embrace of those of different faiths and learning from the best in each tradition, and the list goes on and on. As it was said about Ibn Arabi, the 13th century Arab Sufi mystic poet and scholar, he is a man for this time because he has his foot in every camp. And I decided to immerse myself in his writings and the environments that shaped him, seeking to understand what led him from being born as someone who was in very much in a sectarian, exclusive Christian environment, to becoming, and very intolerant, to someone becoming someone who embraced all in our world, and as a result, has kind of been embraced by all. It took me all over the world, to museums, art galleries, uh, churches, mosques, synagogues, and through revolutions and counter-revolutions, literally, as well. And it first involved, over the course of several years, visiting all of the places that he lived and taking Khalil with me, so to speak, and reading everything he wrote in the place that he wrote them, in the order that he wrote them in. It also led me to the far-reaching influences that his writings and art have traveled. I began in his birthplace village, that magical little village up in, in the, the mountains of Lebanon, Bishari, and then on to Boston, where he and his family emigrated, to Paris, where he did his art training, and then, of course, here to New York, where he spent most of his adult career, ending up, of course, of all places, quite surprisingly, in Mexico City at that spectacular Museo Sumayo uh, that has actually the largest collection of his art and uh, memorabilia in the Western Hemisphere. And it didn't take me long to realize that I knew a lot less about Khalil than I thought. Everybody seems to know, as you just raised your hand, but so few know much about him. I knew he was Lebanese. I knew he came from Christian background, though I must admit, having grown up in a Muslim country who loved Gibran as a young man, I thought actually he came from an Islamic background. 
I knew he lived in the early 1900s, but what I didn't know was far greater. I didn't know popular culture that Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash were tremendous fans of Khalil Gibran. Elvis Presley had completely memorized the prophet and there are numerous stories where he would challenge people, open it up on any page and he could just continue it all the way through and he gave thousands of copies to other people. When my book came out I got a, a quickly received a postcard from uh, Roseanne Cash thanking me for highlighting Gibran because he was such a figure in her father's life. I knew, I didn't know that he knew the Irish poet William Butler Yeats, the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung, and the Nobel Prize laureate Rabindranath Tagore. I didn't know that he met Auguste Rodin, the French sculptor, when he was in Paris. On the more humorous side, I didn't know that during the height of the American prohibition against alcohol, Khalil, with his proclivity to Iraq, that strong Lebanese anise-flavored drink, was able to secure this continuing uh, flowing stash of the contraband. I didn't know that he was seen as a political revolutionary early on in his career, speaking out in his writings against the injustices brought upon his people by the Ottoman Empire, calling out on his fellow countrymen to rise up from themselves and, and themselves free themselves from that oppressive yoke. And I didn't know that one of the wealthiest men in the world, when I wrote the book, he was the wealthiest man in the world, man in the world, Carlos Slim, actually has the largest collection of Khalil's art and writings in the Western Hemisphere. I didn't know, and it's somewhat controversial, but from what I can tell, it's true, that President John F. Kennedy's, one of his most famous quotes, ask not what this country can do from you, for you, ask what you can do for the country, came from an article he wrote in Arabic to his countrymen. And I had no idea of the scope of his influence worldwide, both in terms of his reach geographically and to the diversity of the breadth and breadth of the groups that actually identify with him. As the renowned Syrian poet Adonis summed it up perfectly when speaking about Khalil, he's a star spinning outside the orbit of that other sun in his universal acceptance. Khalil, or Gibran, Khalil Gibran was born in 1883 into a Maronite Christian family, high up in the mountains of Lebanon, a region known as the Kadisha Valley, the Sacred Valley, a spectacularly beautiful area. It's a place that had sheltered its people during various invasions, and it resounds with majestic natural beauty, which had an important and lasting influence on Khalil the rest of his life. He was born during a period of political and interreligious strife, as well as a time full of religious corruption, and during the latter part of the 400-year-long Ottoman occupation. But he was a creative child early on, and his mother kind of quickly sensed that caring and uh, sensitivity in his, in his own life, and so she turned out to be very much an empowering presence right from the beginning, and she would encourage him artistically. She once gave him a copy of Leonardo da Vinci's, it was a book of his artwork, and he recalls that it being one of the most pivotal moments in his life, and he was six years old. He wrote of the experience, I'll never forget that moment as long as I live. It was as if a ship lost in the fog had suddenly found a compass. His grandfather had been a Maronite priest, and thanks to his mother, he was taught all these marvelous, epic, biblical stories which of course captured his imagination at a young age and show up again as imagery throughout his art and his writings. Because his father wasn't very reliable, prone to drink and gambling debts, they ended up being ousted out of their living quarters, their home, and he was accused, accused of embezzlement, locked up, and as a result his family decided, his mother, but decided to immigrate here with her relatives to the United States, and he came along with his mother, older half-brother, and two younger sisters. He only spent 12 years, those first 12 years, really, in any significant way in Lebanon, but in that magical mountain setting. But it was to serve as the foundation for his spirituality and worldview for the rest of his life. And once here in the United States, he settled into Boston's South End, and he began to learn English, and a whole new world of artistic influences began to open up for him. And as happens with many immigrants, 
His mother thought, oh, he's losing the best of our culture. And then she sent him back to finish his high school years in Beirut. And the story unfolds from there. Upon his return to Boston, within an 18-month period, he lost one of his sisters and his half-brother to tuberculosis, and then his mother to cancer. After a devastating fire that destroyed pretty much all of his artwork to date, he began to write more intensely and became very involved in the world of Arab immigrant writers in Boston. And he began to express his feelings through outspoken articles in Arabic newspapers in the United States, I mean in the US, and books and magazines. And as an immigrant, he discovered he actually had a freedom to write in a way he would not have had had he been living in the Middle East at that time. For the next 10 years, from 1903 to 1913, from the age of 20 to 30, he would seek to balance, really, the push and pull of these two linguistic and artistic worlds, and he found himself poised at a confluence of cross-currents between East and West. And he was determined to tear down walls of injustice, and he eventually found himself threatened with excommunication from authorities in the Maronite Catholic Church of his upbringing. And I love to tell this story because, as a bishop, you'll like this. His first brilliant work was Spirits Rebellious, in which one of his short stories is titled Khalil the Heretic. And it blasts the hypocrisy of religious corruption and oppression of the weak and vulnerable. Not surprisingly, not too long after, that, long after this, while he was in Paris, representatives of the Maronite Catholic Church from the Patriarch were visiting France, and they asked to see him. And he relates the encounter quite lightheartedly. One bishop had a sense of humor, the other none. <laughs> Not much has changed, actually. <laughs> Non-humorous took him aside. You have made a grave mistake and are making a grave mistake. Your gifts you are using against your people, against your country, against your church. And the holy patriarch realizes this and now seek out every copy of the book and destroy them all. Through his Arabic novella, Broken Wings, he became an advocate for women, well ahead of his time. He had an incredibly high view of women, whether friend or stranger or lover or sister or mother, and he consistently fused his admiration for them into the essence of his paintings, as you'll see in drawings and his writings. It's especially noteworthy considering the patriarchal society that he actually grew up in, and also, here in the United States, we were immersed, of course, in the thick of the right for women to vote at that time. However, albeit an activist early on, over time, he often wrote of growing into our greater selves. It's a lovely phrase. And he matured into someone with a graciousness towards all and an all-embracing spirituality that reaches across the divides of humanity using many of his creative gifts to communicate those spiritual insights. At a very crucial time in his life, his lifelong friend and patron, Mary Haskell, came alongside to support him and sent him on a course in Paris that would allow him to pursue and cultivate his many gifts. And he was there for two years. And after his time in Paris, he moved here to New York City, and he continued to publish works in Arabic, exhibited his artwork at two very significant galleries here, and in 1918, his first book written in English was published, The Madman. And it was quickly followed by a second book in English titled The Forerunner. And then in 1923, his third book in English came out, The Prophet, which quickly gained worldwide acclaim as his message of universality was reaching wider audiences. He also worked, and I know we're gonna talk about this a little bit, on his longest English book, Jesus, the Son of Man, which I actually think is his masterpiece. For much of his adult life, he worked on it seeking to return the Jesus that he felt had been disfigured here in the West back to his Middle Eastern origins. And he published that creative masterwork just three years before he died at the age of 48. The more I studied of his fascinating life, the more intrigued I became not so much just with the specifics of his art and writings, but also with his inner journey. And more than anything else, it was evident that he lived his life toward a deeper dimension, and he wove this passionate intent into the core of his writings and art. He was a natural mystic 
who quite simply sought to build bridges and tear down walls. And in this regard, the overarching themes really, and I think you'll see this very much as well within the work all around you, are twofold as far as I'm concerned. Deep. As Khalil plumbed the depths of his inner life, he went to the core of human existence. He was forever exploring the deepest of life's questions. On the purpose of being, he said, spiritual awakening is the most essential thing in life, and it's the sole purpose of being. He who does not befriend his soul is an enemy of humanity, for life emerges from within. And he described himself, literally so, as going into the silence. Only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. He named his studio here in New York a hermitage, the hermitage. And he consistently succeeded at crafting these really poetic and artistic invitations to journey toward the depths of oneself, exploring that rich reservoir within. In another reflection, he notes, God has placed in each soul an apostle to lead us on an illumined path. And yet many seek life from without, unaware that it is within them. And he was constantly listening, paying attention to life and ever in search of greater interior depth. The soul is mightier than space, he said, stronger than time, deeper than the sea, and higher than the stars. He was preoccupied during his entire life with the depths he knew the spirit of humanity was able to plumb and the heights he was convinced humanity was destined to scale, always striving toward this deeper dimension. He said about his painting, when I paint a picture, I try to give the picture a presence. It's the coming together of certain elements in a certain way as if they make a sort of path along which God can come through to our consciousness. And he saw depth everywhere. And it's that voice within a voice that Khalil wanted his readers to hear when reading his writings. The deeper he went, Interestingly, the wider his embrace became. The depth of Khalil's spiritual journey led to this extraordinary breadth of spirit in which he experienced the oneness of humanity. The reservoirs that he cultivated in the deep gave him the capacity to go wide. As, and arising from this internalized bridging of the Eastern and Western influences in his life, a faith emerges that has transcended all cultures and traditions. He was addressing his fellow Arabs in the Middle East and he wrote, humans are divided into different clans and tribes and belong to countries and towns, but I find myself a stranger to all communities and belong to no settlement. The universe is my country and the human family is my tribe. Thou art my brother and sister because you are human and you both are children of one Holy Spirit. We are equal and made of the same earth. And he went beyond religion to the core of a universal spirituality. Your neighbor is your other self dwelling behind a wall, he said, and understanding all walls come down. And Khalil recognized, of course, the necessity of borders and nations, and yet he really strove toward a borderless citizenship that transcended geography. And I love the way he expressed his collective embrace of humanity with the visual imagery of a cloud. Should you sit upon a cloud, you would not see the boundary line between one country and another, nor the boundary stone between a farm and a farm. It's a pity you cannot sit upon a cloud. And touching on one of the most sensitive topics of all religion, especially in the Middle East, you're my brother and sister and I love you. I love you worshiping in your church, kneeling in your temple and praying in your mosque. For you and I are children of one religion and the varied paths of religion are but the fingers of the loving hand of the supreme being extended to all, offering completeness of spirit to all and anxious to receive all. Although Khalil spoke very directly of God, his writings and art were concerned with a far deeper 
aspect, and that is of living in harmony with one another and with creation. So his quest actually became an opportunity to unearth that which is woven into the very fabric of the environment. In other words, creation within the religious tradition. And in an age in which issues in our environment are at the forefront with deep respect for the earth, Khalil's holistic worldview rings forth. Just, as after, just after Easter in 1931, after a battle with ill health, Khalil lay dying. He was taken to St. Vincent's Hospital, not far from here in New York City, which is now closed. The same hospital that had received the victims of the September 11 attack. At age 48, with cirrhosis of the liver and tuberculosis in one lung, Khalil slipped from this world into a realm he believed would be an endless dawn forever the first day. In the breadth of diversity and the outpouring of appreciation for his life says it all, reaching across all religious and cultural divides. His body was made the pilgrimage back to Lebanon, according to his will. Upon arriving there, the ship arriving in Beirut, the coffin was opened and he was awarded posthumously the decoration of fine arts medallion from the government. Then led by governmental dignitaries, French military officers, diplomats from all over the world, and leaders from Christian, Muslim, Druze, and Jewish communities, a mosaic of diversity along with crowds of schoolchildren, the entourage processed past thousands of admirers who lined the streets. One th once thought of as a rebel by the Maronite church, in the end he's welcomed home as a celebrated son as they headed to the Maronite cathedral. One of the, interestingly, one of the Christian uh, uh, individuals speaking about his life said he was a Sufi sage for all humanity. <laughs> then the procession went 50 miles up back from Beirut up the mountains into Bishari. And he was eventually laid to rest there as requested in the hermitage grotto of his childhood, which is now the Gibran Museum, which a number of these works actually come from. And more than ever, Khalil's own words rang true, for in one soul are contained the hopes and feelings of all mankind. Khalil's life journey of depth and breadth, I think, can't help but to challenge all of us today. And his words continue to reverberate in hearts and stoles, souls, stirring the reader, the hearer, whoever he or she may be, to journey toward a deeper dimension. He reminds us that it's time to set a, reach across the divides and surround, that surround us and break down walls of injustice and inequality. It's time to build bridges in whatever ways we can conceive and to seek peaceful resolutions. It's time to defend the vulnerable and the oppressed. It's time to unite and see our own reflections in the faces of others. It's time, oh, it's time to find a way to carve out room for quiet and respect for creation or the environment. And it's time to delve deeper, past the imperfections and trappings of religion, to the core of life. In one final vignette from Khalil, his words inspire and challenge us toward our greater selves, that phrase he loved so much. It's titled, Set a Sheet of Snow White Paper. Set a sheet of snow white paper, pure was I created, and pure will I remain forever. I would rather be burnt and turned to white ashes than suffer darkness than to suffer darkness to touch me or the unclean to come near me. But the ink bottle heard what the paper was saying, and it laughed in its dark heart. But it never dared to approach her. And the multicolored pencils heard her also, and they too never came near her. And the snow white sheet of paper did remain pure and chaste forever. Pure and chaste and empty. I close with the moving words of Khalil's good friend, Mikhail Naimi, who wrote the first biography on him just three years after his death. For some purpose unknown to you and to me, Gibran was born in Lebanon at the time he was born. And for a reason hidden from you and me, Arabic was his mother tongue. And it would seem that the all-seeing eye perceived our spiritual drought 
and sent us this rain-bearing cloud to drizzle some relief to our parching souls. Thank you. Thank you. That was um, very moving. Um, Bishop Paul, thank you. Just want to take you all in. Um, thanks for coming out. What a beautiful um, gathering um, and a wonderful summer evening at the Drawing Center here in Soho, New York. I just wanted to give you a, a brief introduction to um, the Foundation for Spirituality and the Arts to contextualize this evening's program a bit. Um, and um, I will just start by sharing um, the purpose, uh, which began from this recognition, um, in fact, at the age of 20, um, I was in front of a Giotto painting when um, I felt um, that my world changed and I was no longer going to be shuffling paper, becoming a lawyer, and came back to New York and um, dove right into um, studying art, art history, and began making exhibitions um, in New York City nightclubs. In fact, one of the, my, my first exhibitions um, were inside of a famous nightclub turned uh, church turned nightclub called The Limelight in the 1990s. And I'm honored to actually have one of the artists that I showed there, Holton Roller, here in the audience tonight. So full circle. All is connected. Religion and spirituality have been the great, greatest of wellsprings for the artistic imagination for centuries across world history and continue to, to be till this day, despite the appearance of a vast gulf between the contemporary art world on the one hand and the realms of religious faith and spiritual expression on the other. To my great astonishment and delight, we've been discovering and uncovering a great deal of art, exhibition making, and even writing surrounding the topic for decades. As far as we can trace back to the beginning of modernity and beyond. Our aim with the Foundation for Spiritual Spirituality and Arts, yes, it's a big lump sum of words, FSA, has been to open, to cultivate, and nurture relationships between these two spheres by opening dialogues for collaboration between contemporary artists, spiritual leaders, sacred spaces, and communities of faith, and contemporary art institutions, while also filling the gap of context and information about the history of their connectivity in the recent and distant past. We do this through residencies, interactive and performative art making and reflective writing commissions, public forums, and online showcasing of recent and historical examples of what we call inspiring and noteworthy. Current and distant practitioners, not only visual artists, but other disciplines relating to and informing modern life and contemporaneity, such as architecture, literature, poetry, music, theater, and film. We research and highlight exhibitions, books, and scholarly and educational texts to help us respond to many bold but sincere questions, such as what is really keeping more artists, exhibitions, collections, and art historical discourses from speaking directly and sincerely about a belief in God or affiliation with religion and or spiritual practice. 
is our disenchantment with museums, galleries, and university departments neglect of communities of faith justified at a time when many have devoted dedicated attention to diversity as a top priority on their agenda? Could the answer to all these inquiries lie in the case of a missing language? Did we never develop the tongue to tell the concurrent intermingling of ideas from both sides of the aisle? Can we make a new lexicon of glorious intersectionality that links the space between these two assumed opposing arenas where our spirits roam? Suppose we are ready for such a middle ground tongue to reveal itself. Can we vocalize without the baggage of our curatorial expertise steeped in decades of worth of suspicion, identity politics, and east-west superiority inferiority complexes to sufficiently think, speak, and make art related to faith, religion, and spiritual transcendence? Some questions for you to think about as um, Bishop Paul Gordon and I um, begin to go a little bit deeper into um, the journey of um, Khalil Gibran. These are um, a section of our website that showcases um, exhibitions and um, artists, writers, and historians um, that have contributed to this conversation. Um, but were never really um, completely uh, considered through this lens. I invite everyone to visit our website. Uh, it's a nice and growing archive. Please feel free to share anything that we may be missing um, that is significant to this context. Thank you. I would like to start off just sharing my own story a bit about my relationship with Gibran. When I read his work, um, I felt them so entirely compelling and complete that his biography didn't really interest me per se. I didn't really look into who he was very closely. I just loved that he felt uh, somehow shrouded in an Eastern resonance but, but yet he felt like he spoke a tongue that was written and belonging to the whole of humanity, but also to the animal kingdom and to nature and the cosmos. And that is what I felt when I read him um, in my 20s. And his text felt clear and profoundly intelligent, not masked by conceptual clouds, his poems, like a great kawali call and response, felt like questions and answers, as if in conversation with himself or a friend, which could be any one of us. So the question, although even though it was answered by him, continued to ring in my ears for months on end, because what I could feel was the never-ending emergence from the depth of his being, um, which was always somehow what I now call source. And I, I was very touched when I read your book recently um, because I, I feel like I have grown so much in my own journey. Um, I too was an immigrant and I have to say that there, were, there was a part of me that didn't want to be emotional reading your book um, because I felt like, well, I understand this. I understand so much of his journey, um, and I have processed so much of it in myself. Um, and uh, finally, uh, this weekend, I had to kind of allow myself to be emotional and, and even weep, um, because 
it took me back to that feeling of uh, knowing that, you know, we're all pieces of the stars and, and yet, um, you know, at a certain moment in life, especially um, coming here and not having, uh, having to start all over with a whole new language and also the projections of all um, people onto you, uh, the images that come from the outside um, that doesn't reflect who you are uh, was so shocking and so painful that I recall, uh, you know, my whole of the, my 20s just living like having to prove myself. And that is how it, I felt um, Jevron kind of had to do that when he arrived here with his community um, and, and um, the, the need to be an activist. Not that he didn't feel it um, deeply, uh, the, the pain of um, what was, his region was going through. Um, and yet simultaneously he was always aware that there was something more than the human drama. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that. Um, if you can speak to um, the, the conflict he had for which he has been criticized um, also, uh, that he was a rebel and he was an activist and he was really someone that was interested in politics, yet he uh, somehow um, did take advantage of Orientalism. Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, or the, 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 the construct of East-West, um, the so-called bridge that, in fact, tonight you keep speaking about. Um, he was criticized for, and um, and and at some point he began to distance himself, and his work became so much more um, about the internal development rather than the external uh, fixation or approaching the problem of the world from the outside um, in. I don't think I need to say anything more. <laughs> that was great. Uh, I think Gibran is immensely complex. His life was complex. Uh, his spirituality in its complexity ends up powerful in its simplicity. That's the great paradox in, the, in, a, in many ways. And that was kind of his journey. But I don't think... Uh, I always say there were, we would never have Gibran if it were not for two things. One is a, uh, the experience of sorrow and suffering. I mean, he hurt deeply. He died of cirrhosis of the liver. And I, the reason I'm always taken by Gibran is because here is someone who can guide us and lead us into, I think, what I would say is a deeper dimension into ourselves and the transcendent, and to connect with the transcendent, however one wants to see that. Um, and yet, wasn't a saint. And, um, and so, uh, in that sense, I think he is someone, obviously extremely gifted, and not all of us are gifted in that way, but someone that we can relate to. Uh, because he goes through that which we have gone through. So that's the first thing. You cannot understand Gibran without suffering. And that goes from serving from issues of identity early on to, to very practical material things to um, rejection of his own people, by, from his own people uh, for a period of time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The second thing one cannot and this is where the East-West connection is very powerful. There would be, in my view, no Gibran. We wouldn't be here today if Mary Haskell had not been in his life. And Mary Haskell, uh, someone he met in Boston, a little older than he was, but who uh, profoundly admired and respected and saw in the potential in Gibran's soul, I would say, and served to be... Uh, 
in a sense, his right arm really helping to facilitate all throughout his life. And some of the work here is largely coming from uh, a work she uh, gave to the Telfair Museum in Savannah. And I think it's a beautiful, the East-West connection truly was there all almost from the beginning. And so thankfully, I, I mean, uh, as much attention in many ways sometimes needs to be given to Mary Haskell as well. Which means all of us have this unique role, whether it's behind the scenes or very up front, in empowering and coming alongside others and toward enabling them to be all they can be. And she did that. So. Yes, I think that um, his, uh, so many of his drawings, um, revolve around the figure that we call a woman or female. I think it's so much more in its connection to his connection with nature and love for nature, which I wonder you can um, reflect a little bit more since you had an entire chapter of your book um, in which you titled The Tempest. Um, and um, Gibran's um, enamoration with, um, with storms and um, really uh, in the intensity of what nature offers and its connection to his own spiritual quest and, and journey, but also in relationship to maybe the, the collective the collective struggle in and the individual, the collective and its relationship to a much bigger um, story, again, beyond society, uh, which I think, you know, so many of us in, in my mind get so wrapped up around uh, what the, the, the human struggle and we want to understand everything from the mind of the human and the experience of the human when um, I think um, w what he was trying to open up for us was um, this door to understanding how, f how much we don't actually know about our own greatness and relationship to, to the, the divine. Um, that the divine is not something um, that's outside of us that we have to wait for, but somehow go towards wow okay <laughs> um they um where do i start first of all in the tempest i think he has a short story and by the way i think it's important to know that in the arab world they see gibran's writing differently than we do because he was known for short stories there and um and early on, of course, for some political activism and uh, as a younger man. And they don't, until later on in, uh, in I mean, in, in the 20th century when his art was shipped back and the art and the Gibran Museum was formed, most Arabs didn't think of him as a visual artist either, uh, which is kind of interesting as well. Uh, a lot of us don't know much about that right in the West either. And so this is, I think, really uh, a, a powerful exhibition and very important. So thanks for doing this. And having traveled to a lot of these places and not having to ask for uh, art on loan, I want to say Claire's done an unbelievable job to bring this. It's not easy. So. But. In, the, in terms of nature, uh, he wasn't, and it's interesting, uh, often uh, he's referred to as a pantheist, where, which means that in nature, uh, nature is essence God as well. I would say he was not a pantheist. He was a pantheist is the word, and that is that the creator, however one wants to term that, his work is seen within all of creation, part and parcel. You can't separate them, just like Gibran is in here, right? And so it's a very different way of understanding. Uh, and no Middle Easterner would 
uh, very, especially back then, would, uh, would uh, espouse what today we call pantheism. You know, they would see that in that context very much as idolatry, actually. So they would be, there's, a, there's a differentiation there. Storms, for him, were very powerful. And I, he sums it up, I think, best with a little short story called The Tempest. And in The Tempest, it's a young man named Yusuf al-Fakri who wants to, he's always heard about this hermit that's up there in the forest in a little hermitage. And the storm is pelting down during the, during, in the forest. And so he wants, actually, he thinks, oh, I'm going to take advantage. I can get shelter in there, but I also can vi visit this hermit, uh, hermit or this uh, monk hermit. And uh, so he goes in, and the, and the monk uh, receives him wonderfully, espouses all this beautiful wisdom, etc. And then, almost at the height of the story, the hermit in the storm is pounding down dangerously outside. And the hermit heads out into the storm and says, I trust that someday you will learn to embrace the tempest. And I think that's what Gibran found a way to do. And obviously spirituality was uh, an oasis in many ways for him and served as kind of the pilgrimage that he was on. And I think that's why I love that phrase of his. He's saying, you know, toward, toward our greater selves, and at the greatest self that we are, that is what? Fully made in the image of whatever one wants to say, God or the divine or, you know. And, um, and so, and seeing everything that way changes how we see and treat the other, right? Very much so. Um, I forget your, your, the second point there, but I, I, was that enough? That's okay. I can yes, keep we can, we can move okay. on. Um, I, I wanted to say that I, I loved Claire Gilman's um, essay um, title in the catalog, um, Khalil Gibran, Formlessness with Formations. And she talks about Gibran's work as timeless because of their quiet, um, heretic aspect, contemporary because of their quietude um, was invaded by a kind of restlessness that makes their subject hover and dissolve simultaneously. Um, she writes about a work that instigated this exhibition for her. The image struck me as outside time, not because it existed in a static universe, but because it appeared to occupy an unlocatable non-space full of internal movement and irresolution. Um, I, I find that incredibly um, beautiful uh, reading of uh, Gibran, um, because we could walk around and um, look at its almost perfection uh, or the desire for perfection that comes through um, in, in some way, and yet um, the energy um, that oozes out of each work um, is a kind of suspense, uh, deep desire <laughs> that's not quenchable. Um, and um, in, a, in, in, in a way, that is the most uh, interesting form of contemporaneity um, that, that any artist could offer us. Um, and yet, at the same time, um, something that I, I would want to discuss is um, the importance of harmony for him, um, the, Im the importance of channeling flow <laughs> or channeling something, because he often um, talks about like emergence, it, something emerges, um, which is, um, a, I think, a very challenging thing for any artist to do. And so many of my visits with hundreds of artists around the world, um, at some point in their studio, we come down to the, the question of the process, and it always comes down to like, at some point I just have to let go. And um, it's, it's interesting for me to consider, um, you know, 
Yas Rodin and you know many other um, uh, figures that he encountered, um, and their their uh, influence in his work intellectually. Um, some people have even talked about uh, Nietzsche as, as and his his work uh, and the way that he wrote his book. Um, being almost a model for the, the prophet, the way that he wrote the prophet as uh, in this very didactic um, manner. Uh, that is still um, a kind of a question, a posing of question and answer. Um, so let me see if I uh, can get myself to the question. Um, yes, uh, the desire for beauty the greater beauty, um, which uh, I, brings me to who were his spiritual um, influences. Because I think that's really important for us to consider. Uh, it's the last thing that we ever really consider when, in these types of conversations. Um, and uh, you have talked about, uh, we, you know, we've heard about the Tagore, um, we heard about the Baha'i uh, uh, religious leader who he met and he painted. Um, he had an entire series of works called the Temple of Art in which he was basically um, drawing all major figures that he connected with in his time that obviously he had to have some form of uh, reverence for if he was going to make their image. Um, but I would love to hear a little bit more about um, Jesus, son of man, and Gibran's um, relationship to Jesus, um, because that's the one thing that maybe um, what either draws people to him or uh, shuns them away. Mm -hmm. And here's an opportunity for us to hear his relationship between his art making and creative process, the process which was always unfolding, never complete for him, and um, perhaps understanding Jesus as, as a, also as a creative figure. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating uh, topic in Gibran's life. Um, I think First of all, to me, Gibran embodies, and I think it was instinctual at first, looking, he was a searcher, he was a seeker, and the opposite of religion, which teaches us that we arrive, and hence you'll have creeds or whatever, putting boxes, right, around. Gibran was someone who I think was, what we, you could say he was a pilgrim, he was always journeying, and looking for that which he felt um, would ignite that part of his soul in new and fresh ways. And so he was drawn to anyone that exuded that greater depth. It could have been Tagore, uh, though he doesn't write extensively on Tagore. Uh, it certainly was taken, and there's this beautiful passage uh, in his, in his uh, one of his journals, or his letters actually, where he talks about uh, after the Titanic, and of course that, you know, we have 9-11, but the Titanic was a big deal at that time. And he's distraught, and he's supposed to paint a picture of Abdul Baha, the head of the Baha'i, the next day. And he's thinking about canceling, and he decides to go ahead and it ends up being one of the most spiritually profound experiences he had in his life. Uh, and he touched on something. He, he, he felt that Abdul Baha had touched on something that he had yet to experience. Um, so you see him kind of looking at all of this. I mean, I think that's why he was so taken with William Blake, uh, artist and poet, you know, because Blake lives in the imagination, the spiritual imagination, right? And, uh, and so, and, uh, and that's a lot of what you're seeing here is what's happening, you know? He's taking you into another world. Even if you look at the portraits, they're not typical portraits, they're ethereal. 
they're wanting you to enter into another dimension, like what I was quoting there, into the subconscious. And, um, but in his own journey, what's interesting, and Thomas Merton, some of you have heard of Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk, he was so taken with uh, Buddhism and, uh, and, and it, it just brought a whole other dimension to his life. And the Dalai Lama once told Thomas Merton, do not convert to Buddhism. <laughs> you go deep in your own tradition and find the core of what that is and build on that. And so Gibran, I would say, did that as he found his way to um, accept his own identity, his birth identity, albeit a new and a fresh. And that was through a different way of seeing this Jesus figure. Jesus, son of man. Son of man is with the term that, of course, Jesus used to refer himself, to himself. He didn't say son of God. And, and so it's this kind of nebulous, mystical uh, term in many ways. And, uh, but the essence of humanity was there. And so uh, he finds himself, I mean, you, uh, I'm telling you, it's overwhelming how many passages exist about him saying his desire is to write or to paint this Jesus figure. And it grows and grows and grows. Jesus, the Son of Man, is uh, a compilation of like 40, I think 48 vignettes, uh, some fictional, some historical, of individuals who met and encountered Jesus or had some kind of experience directly or indirectly. And beautifully, uh, it just poetically flows. It's, it's magical. But there is a section in here I thought I would read because I think this is, to me, the Jesus, this says everything to me. By the way, he called Jesus the supreme poet who makes poets of us all. I love that. Once every hundred years, Jesus of Nazareth meets Jesus of the Christian in a garden among the hills of Lebanon. And they talk long. And each time Jesus of Nazareth goes away saying to Jesus of the Christian, my friend, I fear we shall never, never agree. <laughs> and so in that sense, he is separating Jesus from a religion that grew up around him over the, uh, the millennia, really, you know. And, uh, and I think returning him as he saw him as this profound display of human perfection, if you want to put it that way, and um, of uh, really a universal figure in that sense. And it's beautiful. And you pick it up because I don't know any of his writing where he writes so beautifully as when he's writing about Jesus. And this is interesting because this also allows him to be widely accepted be, uh, among the large uh, uh, Muslim majority of the Middle East. Yeah. Because they place such great emphasis on Jesus, on Isa. Yes. And uh, who is considered among them, of course, the most important of the prophets. And uh, one should model one's life after the teachings and the writings and the demonstrations of Jesus. So um, anyway, I, that, so I think that's an interesting thing. We in the West who have been kind of tainted or hurt or by religion, often very rightly so. In the Middle East, his talking about Jesus actually makes him much more acceptable and embraceable by Christians and Muslims, interestingly. That is very interesting. Um, well, I had so much more, and I want to be able to give the audience a chance to um, engage, ask any questions um, uh, at this time. We have a bit more um, to explore. Uh, please wait for someone to give you a microphone so that um, we can catch your voice well. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Joel Silverstein. I'm from the Jewish Art Salon and I'm the guest tonight. Um, I want to ask you a question. What made him a dangerous figure in the West then? Was it that he um, disavowed uh, uh, traditional institutions like the churches or was it a political message about the Middle East? Like, What made him so dangerous to Western religious figures? Mm -hmm. Well, what made him dangerous at first on a political sphere is that he was actually, of course, very much threatening the Ottoman Empire, right? And challenging his own people to stand up and uh, to relinquish that yoke of oppression, right? Um, and that was only early, fairly early on, though. 
uh, he moved past that into uh, much more of what I would say would be kind of the spiritual journey and search. Spiritual and literary as well. Um, but uh, the, what challenged, of course, what made him dangerous to the church it was theologically, he's very progressive, right? And not doctrinaire, okay? And so that in itself is a threat to a, a church at that time that was trying to control and et cetera. And of course, he also called out the, the rampant corruption that existed as well. So that's kind of why, yeah. But this idea of this universal spirituality is not necessarily uh, condoned by a lot of religion, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> sadly, but I mean, it, you know. Well, well, let's just put, put that into context. In the essence of every religion, um, especially Christianity, um, Islam, mm -hmm. and uh, Judaism, oneness and unity mm -hmm. is the basic principle. Uh, that's part of the, and I mean, even if you really look at Hinduism and Buddhism, um, in the multiplicity of gods, there's still a, a unity and oneness. So uh, it's the it's the separation of the essence of what religion uh, was created for, or the prophets came about to um, to speak of as poets um, to us. Um, that then gets reinterpreted and channeled uh, and manipulated by um, a human society um, and its culture. Um, that it's the cultural realm aspect of organized religion that would um, that would perceive him as dangerous and a threat. But um, w I think it's important to say that in reality, what uh, made him so appealing to millions and millions of people is that essence that is at the heart of religion that all of us uh, who uh, sometimes judge millions and billions of people of faith um, that is at the heart of what they are subscribing to. Um, just because they're leaders and they're, um, they're in the, the institutions in which everything is wrapped in, packaged, um, does not always uh, you know, prescribe to, those, to that essence or, or is able to em emanate that, um, is what Gibran ultimately had to go back to uh, recognizing at the end and um, separating the two. Um, and that is how his anger and rage um, also subsided over time. Um, and the sorrow began to shift into joy and, um, and, and he kept on going um, deeper into it. Um, but ultimately, um, we we can't be re redu we can't reduce him to um, to to be belong either to a, s a secularist universalist um, mindset because he he did respect um, mm. religion in its in its actual uh, purpose in society and in, in human in, in the human history. But he Any other questions? He wasn't exclusive in how he saw it. You know, yes. So. Andrea? Thank you. Uh, I'm very interested in the connection between William Blake and Gibran. And uh, where would I be able to learn more about this? Would you have a nice, succinct chapter in your biography? <laughs> or no. is it in his letters? Or where would I find more about there this? There are essays. There's been a number of things. There have been a number of things that have been written about that. Um, and I talk about it some, a little bit, in here. Um, I, would, I don't know if Jean Gibran's book mentions it much. No, I, I don't think, think so. I think it really is. Um, I don't think there is a nice, succinct <laughs> source, unfortunately. 
unfortunately, I, I think it really is um, sprinkled throughout his letter. Probably the best source is to, you know, there is that book um, we do have it here that it's a, a, a excerpts from his journals. <coughs> Sorry, this is something picked up for the recording. Um, excerpts of his journal of Mary Haskell's journals and of his letters. Um, yeah. There's thousands more or hundreds more letters um, that are actually in the archive that aren't published. Um, but that would probably be the source, right? Yeah, you know what uh, has, I found fascinating in any of your homes I could go and it would find fascinating as well. I'd like to see the books you have in your home. And there at the Gibran Museum, they have, in effect, his library. And there are a number of books well-used, well-looked-at books on William Blake. And uh, so, and you also get a sense of his literary taste as well, you know, and that I mentioned in here as well. So, I mean, that's something that's often overlooked, but it's an indirect way to see what was a priority to him and where he gravitated to, you know. Uh, thank you. Maybe you've already answered this in the previous questions, but if I understood correctly during the talk that you made a, that there was a distinction made between his kind of affection for Christ uh, versus Christianity, and maybe I misinterpreted that a bit, but could you elaborate a bit, and I think you mentioned also some of his most beautiful writing and imagery perhaps was related to Christ, so kind of how did he see Christ as distinct from Christianity, and how did he feel that he got insight as to who Christ is and who Christ is supposed to represent independent of the religion itself? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, actually. Um, he, what's interesting is, of course, I think if, when all of us historically look at it, Jesus wasn't a Christian, right? And, uh, and the intention originally was that nothing like an institutional religion would grow up around him. He was fully within his own Jewish context, right? Um, at, on the other side, he was also a full-blooded Middle Easterner. And we, of course, the church, the center of gravity, whether it be accidental or intentional, over time moved to the West, right? Rome, Canterbury, etc. And so we've made, you know, I mean, we can all have seen maybe in churches that blue-eyed Scandinavian-looking Jesus, right? Well, nothing could be further from the truth, right? But that's the image that often has been portrayed. When so Gibran found a way and was attracted to um, going back to the origin, really, in many ways. But in terms of how he would, um, where he would be inspired, it was definitely in the Gospels. And when you read his book on Jesus, you also know he knew those Gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you don't write that without saturating yourself personally uh, in a meditative kind of spiritual devotional way in those Gospels. And um, all 48 come from different parts of all four Gospels, interestingly. So, um, but I, he, I think he read the Gospels in many ways like Gandhi read the Gospels. You know, Gandhi was taken with this Jesus figure. In fact, the whole Sermon on the Mount of Jesus forms the very foundation in many ways of his, you know, uh, nonviolent pacifist movement, right? Uh, and I love it because Gandhi, I mean, I remember uh, reading about uh, Western leaders coming to Gandhi in, in India and asking him, how can we more effectively communicate this Jesus figure in your culture? And his first response was, why don't you live more like Jesus? <laughs> And in, in many ways, a Gandhi, a non-Christian, helped to Christianize unchristian Christianity. Did you follow that? And this non-organized Christ following arose in India because of Gandhi's life, because he helped them visualize how Jesus can walk the Indian road. And I think in many ways that's what Gibran was doing uh, within his own culture. So. Hi. Um. I doubt it. I doubt it as a Middle Easterner, you know, but uh, I can't say I've read anything about him eating meat, right? So I don't know, but. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, yeah. hi, um, Christine DePasquale, Religion News Association. So I'm thinking of um, 
I'm Potox, but my name is Asher Lev, you know, and the struggle between your having to make a choice maybe between art and your spiritual or religious convictions. Was there anything at play like that in his life in um, the road he taught or his separation from kind of the strict Christian context in which he, you said he grew up? Related, related to his, uh, Art is art. Yeah. Huh. I can't say I've picked up anything on that, you know. Uh, I'm not sure necessarily his own background would understand his art, right? Or, you know, be uh, as keen on it as maybe he would want them to be. But you remember, he was kind of, his art was here, right? And so they, it was, um, most still don't see him over there as an artist. But, so I don't, I don't, I really haven't picked up anything like that in many ways, so um, it's a good question. I, I will uh, address that um, from, from everything that I dove into. It, it, I mean, the, the catalog for this exhibition is, mm. it, it's, it's absolutely excellent. Uh, excellent. Please, uh, everyone, you must have it <laughs> on your shelf. Um, there are some wonderful um, texts by um, n not only um, writers and thinkers, uh, those who know art and think about it, but also uh, artists um, who've made tributes. And um, I think that one thing we could, I, I could sense from all of the texts um, that were written about the exhibition and Gibran was that there was he didn't make a distinction between his artistic practice, as his art, the flow of art making, and his spiritual quest, the, the, the journey into the depth of what is God and how is he connected to, to that was uh, completely uh, intermingled. And I think that's what makes this uh, exhibition um, at the Drawing Center in this moment so timely and so important because as, a, as an institution, there's a recognition um, of an artist who, um, who wouldn't separate uh, that. And, and he, was, he sprung in the midst of a secular modernist um, moment that, uh, that was basically at its very height or uh, the beginning of its mo momentum, uh, strong momentum. So we can imagine that uh, he was, he had to, he had absolutely no reservation or a uh, question about um, that matter um, in his being for him to be able to continue to make work uh, at, at a time when um, so much was actually already moving from even the figurative to, to abstraction, and um, conceptual um, ideas and, and whatnot. Um, he belonged, though, uh, still, I will say, argue that amongst uh, all of those who are simultaneously uh, having these conversations um, in their art, uh, and yet the lens was, uh, of society was moved towards secularism, but he was amongst a group of artists who were um, doing that incredibly powerfully. And Claire, I don't know if you want to uh, speak to that. I just want to say I wasn't speaking strictly on his visual art. I meant his you know, art mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess, sorry, I guess I, I, oh, I don't think this is on, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah thank, thank you for that, Lisa. That, that, was, that was really beautifully said, and I, I agree with you. And um, I think, but the one thing that I would say that, that is notable is that um, you know, he, he does, I guess, you know, for the fact that he was a, you know, tied to the Christian religion in, in some way, um, you know, his, his work is not depicting religious themes pretty much ever, um, pr pretty much ever, you know, n never. There is no imagery of, um, of anything religious. Absolutely. Um, and so I think... Um, how he sets his art apart is that you know it, 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 his 
I guess you could say there's, there's, you know, his art is spiritual because everything he did came from this place, you know, that we've been discussing, which is this place of a of a quest towards um, towards something transcendent. And but he's expressing that in different ways. In his books, he expresses that in the manner that is appropriate to that form, and in his art, he expresses that quest, that journey, that that sense of longing, that sense of um, you know, something that's unresolvable um, in the form that's appropriate to his art. Um, and so I think that was kind of how he, you know, made peace with it because he really was working within each discipline and doing what, what was necessary to that discipline. That's what makes his art, um, you know, something of value to, to, for us to um, appreciate as works of art because they are they are work you know they are worked through on their own terms. It's interesting. He was uh, it's uh, it's quite paradoxical too because if you look at what he surrounded himself with, like his little studio apartment here, the largest piece of artwork was this beautiful tapestry of a Mongolian or Asian mm -hmm. Jesus hanging on a cross. And he put, he had a table that made it look like an altar with two big brass candlesticks, like a church. Uh, and I mean, so it's interesting. So he, he kind of, he lived these both, both aspects in some ways, you know. Um, is this working? How does this? Yeah. Um, could either of you um, address? his book, The Art of Music, and what it says there, and how that might relate to his visual art. Well, that was the first thing he pretty much wrote, actually. Yeah. And um, I will read you a few sections here, if I can find it. And by the way, I, um, on my first trip for this book, I, um, when I was coming back from Beirut to Cairo, Feirouz, who is one of the most well-known uh, singers in the Middle East, uh, though she's getting older now, um, she has a marvelous song where she uses his poetry, you know, as the lyrics. And um, so I was mentioning the person I was sitting next to on the plane that I was working on a book on Gibran as we're heading toward Cairo, and uh, he started singing Feirouz's song, and all of a sudden the plane, the entire plane, started singing. <laughs> because they all know it, and it was marvelous. But uh, in his, this essay, which is really one of the first major pieces he wrote uh, on music, and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful kind of treatise to music, but the soul of music is of the spirit, and her mind is of the heart. Our souls are like tender flowers at the mercy of the wing, winds of destiny. Wisdom that has been, eternal wisdom that has created the song of the bird is such music that makes us ask ourselves and the meaning of the mysteries contained in ancient books. So he's actually again even there using mystery, music, to take one into a transcendent deeper dimension. And that was when he was young when he wrote that. Hi, thank you. Um, following up on, on these recent comments about how much his visual art was you know, mingled um, with his writing, uh, I wonder if, if he felt that uh, his, you know, his spiritual practice of you know, meditation or prayer, contemplation or whatever, he may have done very naturally or even inevitably led to his visions. You know, if his, if his, the visions that he painted you know, came out of you know, psychic visions, uh, uh, and and did he did he encourage you know that that mm -hmm. kind of a practice or no. do we know? Mm -hmm. Want me to answer that? Yeah, uh, no, not at all. Uh, in fact, his he uh, his uh, writing uh, and even often he would describe he would share about what he was intending to draw or or uh, create visually uh, was with great intention. So you would see this, he's saying, I'm thinking about, or I'm working on, or I'm, you know, this, um, no. And, but the one thing I would say is, you know, uh, Gibran's claimed by every imaginable circle, right? Gibran, the essayist, Gibran, the short story writer, Gibran, the interfaith mentor, Gibran, the, 
the, uh, the theosophist, Gibran, the New Age guru, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you want to say, well, the real Gibran, please stand up, right. you know? And, and I think uh, because, and one thing that kind of hurt him, though it actually definitely was great for sales, for the prophet is in the 60s and 70s, the prophet became kind of an alternative, had a resurgence, right? An alternative spiritual book. And out of that, it ended up being increasingly claimed by more of a new age kind of movement, which wasn't Gibran, you know? It didn't exist back then in that way. And so um, there is a transcendentalist dimension a little bit, you know, that he was influenced by when he was in, in early on. But um, no, not... Uh, that and I also would say I uh, haven't picked up anything about intentional meditation or any of that I have the feeling he just kind of embodied and lived you know so yeah, yeah hello there was one in the back there oh, okay. uh, yeah <laughs> oh, go ahead go ahead um, as, as a Christian growing up in an Islamic society um, can you discuss the role, well, if he shared the role that Islam played in his spiritual growth? Um, you mentioned that his wife, you know, at, uh, at his funeral said that he was a Sufi. Um, and so I'm imagining that it had to come up. Yeah, um, exactly. And was it only a political and cultural uh, space where he, as a Christian, navigated through? Um, was influence more cultural? Was there an intersection of spirituality and Islamic spirituality in, that influenced him? Um, and also, was his connection to nature any way connected to his rebelliousness against the concept of idolatry in Islam? No. Uh, on the latter question, uh, no. But the, um, I would say that he, uh, again, looking at his library, which is quite interesting, you've got books on Halaj, Ibn Arabi, uh, Rabia. These are all Sufi saints uh, within the Middle Eastern eras, and, and Rumi even, though Rumi wasn't at that time very well known, of course, in the West, interestingly. And, and go ahead, sorry. And, well, and he also did a big series on um, important Islamic Ex religious figures, figures and philosophers for Al Fanun, which was yeah. the Arabic language literary magazine that he founded um, along with some others uh, in New York. So he was very invested, I think, in Islamic thinking. I think it very much influenced Yeah, I, I don't think he writes so much about it himself personally, though. That's only, no, yeah, but right. yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, he, I think he was, an ex but he would have been within the mystical uh, tradition, I think, of interest, mm -hmm. you know. Thank you for a very inspiring conversation. Um, you mentioned Blake, and I was really happy to hear that, of course. Um, but I was wondering if you can speak a little bit on Turner um, as well. And uh, because you mentioned that he was a seeker, and that sort of reminded me of Turner. Um, I, I think he said, um, I'm seeking, I'm striving, I'm in it with all my heart. Um, but is there a connection there with... You mean the artist Turner? Yes. Yeah, I mean, when uh, Gibran was, ba when he was living in Paris, he took a short trip uh, to London and was really, really taken by Turner's work and uh, at the Tate there. And, um, but, uh, but otherwise, I haven't looked into it more than that. Maybe Claire has, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, forgive me for asking what might be the obvious, but um, was he known as an artist? Did he have any exhibitions? Did he sell his work? W w how was the work that we're seeing today, um, how, was it, how did it enter into the world? I think many of us can answer that, but I think it's appropriate that the curator answer that. 
Um, well, I think I think one of the things about him that was interesting is that he was always sort of toggling back and forth between these different identities, right? Between being a writer and being an artist. And he would kind of go through periods of time where he was draw, drawing or make, making art more extensively. And then he would go through periods of time where he wasn't as much. So he did have a moment, um, I guess that was around 19, is he, when was the um, Nodler show? Is that 1920? 18 or something like that 1916 1918 something like that he had a big show of of drawings um because he was working very very avidly on those drawings and that was mostly what he was doing right then um and so he did have a a big show a couple shows like paul gordon mentioned at some major galleries but then I don't know if it was because of the success of The Prophet. Mm -hmm. Possibly that was it. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that book was so successful in 1923 that he kind of shifted, I think, and became sort of accepted that, you know, he was going to find his identity more as a writer and he continued to make art and make drawings. But um, I don't know that he exhibited those works. Um, he made them for his books, um, but obviously he made them as and he spoke about as works in their own right because they were going to be published you know in black and white and they're they're fully realized images but i think he kind of shifted identities from really trying to sort of make a name for himself as a um as an artist to being um i mean yeah to to kind of accepting that he was known as a writer and they they entered they you know not a huge number of them did enter the world, to, to be honest, because that's why the bulk of the work in this show comes from three institutions. So the bulk of the work comes from the Gibraltar Museum, which is where everything that was, I guess he left the remainder of his work that he hadn't already desig given, designated to go elsewhere, um, to the Gibraltar Museum. And he had given a huge uh, body of work to Mary Haskell, as um, Paul Gordon was saying. And so that work ended up in Savannah. And then the remainder of his estate, which was left to his nephew, um, who was also an artist, actually also named George Khalil Gibran, was then, that was what was bought by uh, Carlos Slim. And so that is the remainder of his estate ended up in um, Suma in the in Mexico, but there are there were some works that were sold, and there are a handful of works on display here that um, are in private collections because they did circle around and were ultimately sold at auction and entered private collections sometimes very recently. And there's also a handful of work in other institutions like the Met and the MFA Boston that were gifted to those institutions by individuals who had either purchased them or had been given them by Gibran, I guess in in that day. And there's another interesting point for that. Thank you. Uh, when you said that the work was exhibited at Nodler in, in 1918, which I'm, means... Yeah, I'm not sure it if it 1916, was 1918. Maybe, it might yeah. have been yeah. yeah, somewhere around then. But still, that's when the United States entered World War I, and it was very much on the minds of everyone, including him, I trust. How did that impact his work? Did it influence what he was drawing, what he was writing about. Uh, I'm not actually familiar how it impacted his, no, it, it, I, I his art. I don't think he was as concerned with World War I, honestly, as he was concerned, I mean, with the U U.S.'s role. He was he was much more preoccupied with what what was happening in the Eastern Mediterranean, where yeah. he was from. That was yeah. really what, what, what was consuming him and everything that was happening in Syria and Lebanon and, you know, that area of the world. That was where his political focus was, that was where his activism was, was, you know, he was very involved in, um, you know, uh, when there was a Syrian uh, crisis in Syria and, and uh, mass starvation, and he was very involved in raising funds for that. That was where his focus was. So some yeah. of his colleagues did go to uh, the Paris conference uh, there for peace, and he wanted to go, but he didn't go. So, but like even one of the individuals on the other side, I mean, Rouhani went, so... And lastly, after, was after there the war. any relationship between him and Gurdjieff? No. Do they no. even know uh, no. their paths well, cross? No. Let's not be oh, too, too oh. hasty on that. That's a really interesting um, thing I've, I'm actually um, researching and I've asked around um, because I did read somewhere in one of the articles in the catalog, Gurdjieff was mentioned. Um, 
and and so I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Gurdjieff was both in in France and in um, and in New York. Um, he had a school in New York as well. Hmm. Um, so it is uh, totally possible um, that he had also um, r ran into that figure. Um, I'm sorry, we, we have uh, <laughs> promised that we were going to stop at 8.15. We can keep going. Um, I invite you to please uh, take a, a few minutes to see the show. Is it possible for people to look at the work I mean, a bit more? Certainly we have to um, put, some of the, put the chairs away and things like okay. that. So we will be, we'll be open for a little while longer. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Claire and thank Amy, the Drawing Center. Um, for this generous invitation um, for tonight um, and, and for allowing this, uh, this program to come to life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming.